All right. This is exciting. We yes, will yes. wait. <laughs> I know. I'm just really loving the pink background again. It's it's beautiful. I had to jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know as people trickle in, um, welcome. We will wait for everyone to really join us. But if you are here and you would like to chat where you are coming from, um, I know that we are in a hybrid work environment. So um, hopefully you're logging in from around the, the world. That would be really amazing. I myself am in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So if you've never been, it's a hidden gem. Um, and if you need any travel tips, I am your girl. I can give you some, yes, <laughs> the land of enchantment. I can give you some great places to come and visit um, here in New Mexico. So um, awesome. Yes, Erin, you got it. Oh, fun. Whoop, whoop. Got some East Coaster in here. Got, yeah, Love Seattle that. people. Any Seattle peeps? Seattle or maybe. <laughs> There's always going to be some, some <clears throat> Seattle peeps in here. All right. Michigan. Nice. Man, this is so fun. I love it. Amazing. We are coast to coast here today. All right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Uh, got Virginia in the house. So fun. Awesome. Like I said, as people trickle in, go ahead and post where you are coming from live in the chat to both host panelists, anyone. And we'll probably get started in a couple of minutes. So grab, you know, a, a beverage of your choice, whatever time of day it is, <laughs> where you are at. And all right, Denver, that's where our headquarters is. Super fun. And Houston, <laughs> the land of sweat and humidity, you know. It's like you guys skip over spring, so <laughs> or maybe just have no winter. Um, so that's awesome. Texas represent. Very cool. And then just some housekeeping notes. Um, if you have any questions or comments throughout, we definitely want this to be very engaging. So use the chat. Um, we will more than likely curate all of the questions for a longer Q and A at the end. However, if it's something that we'd love to touch on, like in that flow, then we'll hit it right then. So um, don't be shy. We are here to just have some fun, and um, we'll get started in about you know thirty ish seconds. So less than a minute. Less than a min. What are you uh, sipping on? What's your beverage of choice this morning, Keegan? Hi, <laughs> no sponsors <laughs> here. I'm starting with Celsius this morning. Oh, that's fancy. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's uh, awesome. Pep to the pep to the step, a little, a little boost in the energy this morning. I get it. Well, I know just from experience, you have wonderful energy. So whatever you are doing, maybe I'll just jump on the Celsius train. Just make sure you have your <laughs> high water intake. That's the other recommendation I tell people. Don't, Ooh. don't forget about the high water intake if you're going to drink that much caffeine. <laughs> totally. Awesome. All right. Well, I know that more people are going to trickle in. So let's just go ahead and get started. We're about five after. Um, so today, thank, first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, today, we're really talking about the tried and true steps of maximizing Salesforce, your Salesforce investment. But what does that really mean? And so what we're going to do today is really talk through some of the steps for scaling performance, improving the, the productivity of your organization, creating a successful sales organization, and all doing that with efficient processes and enablement. Sounds wonderful, but like, tell me how. Um, and so we're going to break it down really stage by stage here. We're going to share those processes and steps and even show you, Keegan's going to show you some of the stuff that he's built, um, some of the data that, you know, he's co collected and curated. So without further ado, let me just go ahead and introduce, you're probably wondering who I am. Uh, my name is Laura Wheeler. I am the VP of Revenue Operations and Enablement here at Speckit. I've been at Speckit for actually almost two years about a month shy of two years. And so it's been a, a wonderful experience over here. Um, I will be your host today and I will pass it over to Keegan to give a proper introduction for himself. 
Yes, no, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm Keegan Otter. I am the director of revenue operations and strategy over here at Sendlane, taking us from when I joined as a series A and now we are in the series B club. Oh, awesome. Well, congratulations. And I noticed that since we last spoke, uh, your title has changed. Yep. Previously, you were the senior director of sales and revenue operations, which that's a task within itself, um, managing both sales and the operational side of that. So congratulations on your promotion and welcome to the, to the other side, the dark yeah. side of the revenue operations. Side, yeah. <laughs> um, oh man, that's awesome. Well, congratulations. <laughs> no, but, but lots of fun, lots of, uh, you know, I can still lean back and explain a lot of how we built out the sales side. Cause that was one of my main jobs was to co-build that with the VP build all the process behind that and then pass on the torch. I love that. So, so let's talk about that a little bit because I do want to take us on a, on a prior journey here. Um, as you know, now that you're in sole revenue operations, we're here to solve problems and it's all about finding ways to do things more efficient, simpler, quicker, easier for our stakeholders that you are managing. So I would love for you to take us back to 2022 or maybe even early 2021 when, so can you tell us a little bit about the time when you were in that role, you've identified, you know, either some efficiencies or pains within the business, because I think one thing is understanding awareness as to what is not working well within the organization. And as you were building this revenue team, like take us on that journey of how you were able to identify and the steps that you took to either evaluate or start to make change within your organization. Yeah, from from the beginning, it's, I always tell people before you can make change, you got to be chameleon and see what's there and what's what's not, what's missing, and and what just needs to be built. And the problem we were facing was just the lack of written down processes and mm. basically the enablement behind that. And I kind of we were challenged with, all right, so we got to build all like we got to hire out all these people, build out the sales org, and start producing. But the analogy I always go back to is I'm like, well, if you're going to build the, the best football team or the baseball team, you got to teach them how to throw the ball, catch the ball, hit the ball before you can say, let's go play a game. So mm -hmm. what we did is we actually took a step back and realizing let's build out the infrastructure first, kind of like a product, like how you, you know, in SaaS, right? We've got a product, build out the infrastructure so the product can work, then start going after customers. So in this case, build out the processes, the learning, the how-to then hire the people. So it's plug and play. Uh, I love that. And I think too often, you know, I have been asked, what is that um, big lesson that you've learned in revenue operations? And that is definitely one of them. I think um, if we take that time to kind of pause and understand what is the root cause of what's actually happening. Um, so what were you seeing specifically with your team as you were growing? So from what size to potential, what size, and what were those hurdles that you were seeing that you were trying to either mitigate or the great things to double down on so that you can move forward with a positive growth? Yeah, we uh, were at two reps at the time when I came into Sendlane. Uh, we were at about a 40 person org, a little shy of that. Um, and we needed to scale to the first scaling size was about six to eight. And I immediately knew having a background in enablement, well, these, these tools aren't like turnkey. Everyone knows how to use them. Some people do, mm -hmm. some people don't. Uh, everyone's at various levels. Let's build, up, build out the enablement piece. So that way they have the coach on their shoulder, especially in a remote world, without me actually having, like me being there. And mm -hmm. that's when we evaluated, uh, you know, enablement tools to say, let's build this out. Let's build the content, the infrastructure. So literally after our lessons, they can go back and review those lessons on their own and go forward if they want to with their learning. If they're like, I, I got this, I want to move on to the next phase, they can do that. And so that's where we took it from two to eight. And then basically in the long structure of things in 10 months, two to 40, two to four sellers, two to 40 sellers. Ten lane is just a buck shy of hundred employees. Um, and so we were able to scale that quickly because we had the content and resources built out. We had them overlapping we had them embedded in every tool that they use. So along the way, reps never had this moment of like, I can't do my job. I got to stop. Oh, what's this? Oh, I can search this. Oh, that's how you do it. I'm going to follow along and do it. And so everything just moved faster. And that's why we were able to see, you know, full results 
within the 75 to 90 day mark instead of past that. That's, that's mm -hmm. impressive. And I think scale is really hard right now. Um, you know, people are trying to do less with more, which is the buzz phrase for yeah. the last couple of months. Um, but it seems like you were able to do that and really get everyone on board. So how did that actually pan out with your team? How did you really change that culture of learning within, you know, your reps and, or the new reps that were coming on board and saying, this is how we were going to do it. So what did that really look like? And how did you set yourself up for success? Yeah. Um, well, a, a culture of like empowerment and enforcement of this learning, right? Yeah. Basically what we have is we have an onboarding guy that I'll show later that I built out that has everything and spec it embedded into it. Every single piece of technology that these reps are going to touch wow. has a video walkthrough, screenshot walkthrough, explanations, rules of engagement. So there's like no gray area on how to use this in the, in their daily function. Mm -hmm. Right. And we place that not only, Hey, it's in spec it, but we put it in notion. We embedded it in their outreach, their CRM, mm -hmm. right. We have it for leaders and managers. Cause if they haven't become an expert of that tool, well, they can follow along. So that way they can slowly become an expert of this tool because they have the guidelines and enablement to help them at their own pace. Right. So we can, what we did is we would bring them in to training in person. We would remind them, you can also find these resources here, here, and here. <laughs> and we would assign them tasks to go and learn by doing in these kind of like mock runs, which along the way they had the enablement or the coach on their shoulder to follow along. Uh. I love that. And I love that you mentioned no gray areas because as a revenue ops leader, we hate gray areas. <laughs> we try to define the gray areas. Yeah. We can't have those because it creates, you know, confusion for our sales team. And then it could lead to costly errors, um, in the business. And so, you know, we have this saying, and I love that you went into a little bit of detail too, about like the videos and, you know, some of the content that you're creating. Um, we have a saying at Speckit that is called content is queen, you yep. know, content is queen. So, um, you know, content strategy is a big, big, like overarching umbrella. So when you think about how you approach content now in this new way, so it's micro it's bite size. You said you have an enablement background, so it's shifting the way that like you're delivering this content. How did you approach that with your team? for documentation, long form. Can you share us some of those examples that you had mentioned? We would love to see what that looks like. Yeah. Um, one of the things, uh, skipping ahead is we were able to actually scale and we have an enablement person now too, which just enforces how important enablement is. And yeah. one of the things they found successful too, is not only reinforcing it through lessons like we talked about, but also having those separate channels, having those like the BDRs or the SDRs, the MDRs, the AE, CSMs, having their own chats as well as an overwide org enablement for org wide. Mm. Um, so we've really adopted that even further enforcement. So the communication side, outside of them just seeing it in their workflow on their own time, but the over communication helps with enforcing that. Going back to how it all started was the first objective was to literally just haul everything over in terms of videos <laughs> and content and put it in the enablement. I know it can be a big lift, but it is well worth the 48 hours going dark on a black ops mission to put it in there. <laughs> and when it's done, you see the results. You, mm -hmm. there is more time given back to you to focus on the core competencies that you need to in the lesson plan. And then they can go follow along with enablement on the side. If they, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have the ratings that we did through our, we did a survey and 89% uh, felt confident selling what we sell here at Sendline. We're e-commerce. Wow. So they felt 90% felt confident after two weeks of onboarding. They knew exactly what we sell, what we do and what the tools were. Wow. Because of the enablement that we built out around all that of like who we are, what we do and here, here's your role here's what your goal is. And here's the tools that you use and here's how to use them. All of that was already built out. And that's what I'm going to show you is kind of what we built out in the enablement, combining like this onboarding guide. And then you'll see how everything is tied to spec it. That's awesome. We see and while you pull that up. Yeah. Let's while you pull that up. I love that call out of just the confidence within the reps. So mm -hmm. we are seeing the Speckit website. Is, this, this yes. Notion 
where we get the onboarding guide, and then we're going to show how we give them a greeting of like, welcome to day one. Here's what to expect. And then I you think you're showing um, oh. a different, yeah, the the Speckit website or just to your browser. Whoopsies, technical error. <laughs> no worries. Hey, it was hey, wrong. The, uh... Here we go. <laughs> There you go. Perfect. Like, yeah. Grow at these things with the red off. We still make mistakes. Folks. <laughs> um, awesome. So this is the master copy that we built for all onboarding. So every rep gets this for different, you know, the different role. And we do a video overview uh, introducing leadership and so forth. And then first thing right there is, all right, here are things that you want to check out right away. Put it right in front of them. Let's get you onto enablement. Let's get that downloaded. And then here's why. Because everything that they had to do tool wise, everything is tied to wow. a spec. It. Watch this. That's, in that's incredible. Watch this onboarding workflows and tasks review. And you click that and it takes them where we want to inspect it. So we're already enforcing adoption of one tool and then, by, and then multiple tools along the way. Wow. And then you can see how we have it already turned key. They could follow along, watch this. And then we even have later on in the onboarding to favorite certain items. So it's easy for them to just use the Chrome extension and find their favorites. Wow. So that is the process of which we built was instilling those best practices of here's everything from, as you can see, of like who send their names or ICP to examples to then let's dive in the tools. But instead of just giving you basic instructions and saying this, we literally have everything from a two minute video to a 30 minute like video overview of just shouting a rep that's in. Wow. Okay. Amazing. Follow up question here. Um, can you tell, talk to us a little bit about um, what if people don't have this content already? I know that there are spec. It does offer some out of the box content and there's a ton of help center resources out there for tool adoption, for, um, understanding like process document, uh, documentation, but what happens if they, they're not fully baked on the content yet? Like how easy is it to upload that? You talked about 48 hours black ops mission, but, um, yeah. how, how easy was it for you to put together? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So honestly, I, I had about, I think the reason it, it, I say the 48 hours, it depends on how much content you have. Right. I was fortunate enough having a background enablement that I had a lot of things I could carry over saved on mm -hmm. a drive. Yeah. I think I had about 50 specs that I was able to make within that, like right away turnkey, but we have over 250 now. So what did I do Wow. between the 50 and the 250? Right. What we decided to do is you want to pull aside one of your top reps and just say, Hey, where are areas that you know how this process very well and how would you walk me through it? And then what are processes and areas that you need reinforcement or training on? Because you're, it's okay. You didn't catch on the first time we talked about it. Like where, where does your knowledge lack? Cause what you're doing is you're taking the best approach from your top rep and you're going to duplicate that in the content. Yeah. And you're also seeing where the biggest gap is from your best rep and you're going to enforce best practices. So there is no gray area. And then that they have the knowledge they need. So if they ever come into that area of focus where they might not be an expert on, they have the resources available. That, so is, that is what we awesome. did. And I brought on enablement specialist. I said, I want you to go meet with the top reps and literally just shout at them, get on a zoom and shout at them, record a long recording and then chop it up into bits and pieces that we can use for enablement. Simple, wow. simple way to just get content going. Yeah. And it's easy to create a spec or anything because it's no code within the application. And then that way you're not reliant on anyone internally to have this special skill set. Like you are literally leveraging your needs analysis internally and empowering your, your team. That's awesome. Well, and you can see too. Uh, so we were able to reduce with, with spec it. The, one of the highlights was being able to bolster as much pipeline as we did, you know, that 3.2 million in like six months. Uh, Ooh of only having, it was 3.2, 3.4. And we were literally going from four to 10. Yeah. Right. And That's so that, that little people being able to do uh, that much pipeline and that impact lot, that short of a time was yeah. because the adoption, if you correlate it to the adoption of the content in spec, it was through the roof. You can yeah. see that our high performers are 
actively searching and looking in our enablement collections. They are wow. literally going in and looking at spec they have their favorites picked out for reinforcement of like, oh, I don't know this tool completely 100% to the capacity I want to. I'm going to favorite the spec and go back to it when I hit that hurdle. And you literally could see the high adopters, high performers, the low performers are the ones that were ramping slowly, were lower in engagement. So what we did is we course corrected that saying, hey, here's some specets I want you to favorite. Here's some content I want you to reconsume. Go do this mock again. And then what happened? They might have ramped slowly, but they ended up being performers they're not. Mm, mm. So and that important. actually, yeah, that actually really helps, especially with scale you can actually see where you need to focus your time, either as an enablement specialist or a rev ops, maybe it's the content, maybe it's just reinforcing. And so I really think that that is key. I'd love to also hit on we're in the ever evolving innovation change. Things change. Your ICP might be changing. Um, you might launch a new product. And so some of those processes will be you know, updated. So talk to me a little bit about how you manage like your change management or change enablement, however you want to say it, um, either with Speckit or just internally to develop, um, making that a habit. Yeah, no, we, we did some serious changes when we merged actually business development and sales into one thing, as well as partnerships with marketing and then getting marketing, uh, you know, into our enablement. So a lot of shifts and you're right. It was, we called it change management and enablement. <laughs> and the biggest thing is, okay, evaluate what are the processes that are changing? What are the tools that are being brought in those processes that might be new to people? Build that out, build it out, then bring them in. We, don't, we actually, one of the biggest ways I lead is let's not bring them into a lesson plan. Let's not bring them in into this huge kind of rip and replace of a process until we have it written down. Mm. Until we have yeah. content made. Let's not in, like enforce change until everything's built out because you can say it to a crowd of five you can say it to a crowd of 500 people are going to have questions regardless there yeah. is always going to be confusion everyone takes things in different ways and everyone learns and absorbs at a different pace so you need to have that reinforcing content that they can always go to for confidence yes yes and and that confidence is key. Coach. <laughs> from being yeah. a coach. like you can see it from a sport classroom it's the same way in the workplace Oh, that's awesome. And Jessica actually had a really great question that I think we probably should hit here. So you were talking about those stats of versing like high performers with high usage. Can you talk to a little bit about that, of how you're either monitoring that, whether that's in the dashboard, um, how are you able to measure that performance? Yeah. So I love the new updates with spec where you can actually really see the analytics. We used to meet with our CSM a lot on a weekly basis. We used to do I was thinking only two weeks and then after seeing the insights, I'm like, oh, I want to do this on a weekly basis because I want to <laughs> correlate the data with the reporting I have in our CRM, like Salesforce, of like how reps are doing performance wise. And mm -hmm. we saw that top performers on the dashboards were also top performers, if you want to look at it in that way, or top adopters in Speckit. Wow. Wow. They were the first ones to view a spotlight. They viewed multiple Speckits if we rolled something out new. It wasn't just one time. You would see them review it in a week, four to eight times. Wow. Yeah. So there's views, searches, consumption, all within the dashboards that you're using, and then parallel those with their actual performance within the organization. I am sure that you, and you'd mentioned earlier about competencies and role, you know, responsibilities that you have those benchmarked for an A player culture. Like you are hoping to give confidence to your, your people that they continue to be A players. So well, we it's very, at, very interesting. We saw the data on the other end too, right? We're talking about efficiency. And we all know when you scale, you also have to coach people out. And yeah. not everyone is going to be able to keep up with the scale. So what we also looked at is we always want to learn from anyone we've had to coach out. So what we did is we looked at that data the same way. Okay, they were low on the board. Was there any other analytics or insights where they were low adopters in? Looked at the enablement piece and that's where we really saw it stand out. Okay, not only did people that ramped well and that were consistent high performers adopt the enablement and consume the content at a high rate, but those that did not do well, those that, trend, mm -hmm. that were trending downwards that we eventually had to like, you know, coach out, they were not adopting the process as well. They were, because they were not, uh, them. they were not engaging with them. They were not being enabled because they were wow. not. I th and 
just what you said paired with Jessica's next question that I'm going to reframe into a question for you. I think that when you're in enablement or RevOps or even uh, product marketing, you're creating this content, these SOPs um, and documentation that is meant for our stakeholders. And the biggest piece of the puzzle is how can we get them to consume the, the information, but also directly correlate that with performance and get engagement? Because it is one thing for, hey, I have viewed a spec, but like paralleling those together. So in the case in point where um, maybe you were seeing that lower adoption and you hit a little bit on it earlier, what were your tactics on, you know, getting them back into spec it or wherever they needed to be to like really fine tune that as a habit? Yeah, no, it's, it's not enough just to create it and say it's there. I wish it was, <laughs> but um, well, yeah. we all know <laughs> it's, just, it's not that way. So yeah. what we did is we built this culture of enforcement and, and mm. structure where basically I, I would tell reps onboarding and tell managers to they have this kind of flow of communication go of, hey, if you have a question, search it, inspect it. Excuse me. Yeah. If you can't find it, inspect it, ask a peer, a mm. veteran, especially like that's been there for six months. Chances are they can find it, inspect it. If it's <laughs> not inspected, yeah. go to your manager. Because if your manager can't find it, inspect it. They're going to build it, inspect it. Reason uh, being is that's how we went from, again, 50 to 250. And we have more than that now that we have the, uh, our enablement lead. But that's just to show the amount of growth that we went from 50 to 250 in those six months was, hey, this is an inspect it. I searched, I asked the peer. They don't have it. Um, can you show me? I'm like, not only can I show you, we're going to record it. And you are going to be highlighted in the spec it. Because the question you just asked is going to be asked in the next three months by a new rep. So let's get that content in there so that they can learn and move forward so you don't have to stop what you're doing. And that was the enforcement like that we had when, as we've scaled. So we have you know, up to 40 sellers. We have three managers now you know, on the AE side, BDR side, MDR side, um, and different leaders now in different orgs with using these tools and having the content around it. And it's, okay, you spec it. Or, hey, Keegan, can you show me how to, um, we just got a new content writer. Can you show them how to use outreach? Actually, we have a folder for managers on how to build out content in that tool. Mm. Let's use that. If they have questions, we can help them outside of that. Wow. You're seeing that too with managers. Hey, that's a great question. Did, were you able to find that in spec it? Oh, you haven't looked yet? Why don't you try to find that first? And then I can <laughs> set the time with you. And it's not that we don't want to be good people managers. We don't want to be good leaders but you want to go and enforce the effort and the time and the strategy that was put in yes. behind adding that content is valuable. So you want to enforce that value. Oh, I love that. I feel that those content creators that are out there, um, their hearts are strumming because it takes a lot of time for a needs analysis to understand where reps are, you know, either content is missing, what is being consumed, what is helpful, what is not. And I, I feel that, um, creating that culture of learning one, where it is a, um, self-serve at, at some aspects, um, a culture of reinforcement for your managers, you're getting all of the people involved and closer to the content. So they feel invested. And I think the closer that you're invested, the more you are willing to give feedback on what is working and what's not. And then you are now synergies working as a team. And I think that that's really beautiful um, to make sure that there's a whiff them what's in it for me um, yeah. from the managers, from your stakeholders, and then also from those that are creating content on the enablement rev ops and maybe PMM side. So and you want to build what an awesome story. You want to tell people, ask questions. There are no stupid questions. Like I do say that, like yeah. ask your questions now because the, <laughs> the more questions you ask now, it's better to look like a fool now. So you're the wisest person in the room 30 days from now. Yeah. And I tell you, well, the questions that you ask, you could probably find in spec it, but if you can't, that is your <laughs> signing moment because you just found a hole in our system and you're going to make it better. Like literally yes. we encourage them. If you like try, we try to also make it like gamify it. Uh, mm. gamify, I don't know how you say it, but I tell <laughs> people like, you make it a challenge where try to find where you can't find knowledge in our enablement stack mm. and then you get to be, the superstar in the next one we make. So we kind of make it fun. We're like, oh, I tried to find the answer to this about this process or this tool. I don't see any spec around it. Can we make one? Right. So people yeah. have fun with it now too. Awesome. 
Uh, I love that. And as I feel as a RevOps leader, um, you want to continue to drive that operational excellence um, with some governance and balance for, you know, what you need to do to standardize on most of those items, but also that iterative feedback loop. So how are you balancing that from a governance perspective? Um, Is that with permissioning or just talking a little bit through that so we can get some sort of idea? We do uh, enablement syncs weekly, like Mm kind of open open door, like we'll, we'll present to them what we're seeing on trends and then ask like, Hey, here's what we're seeing on the operation side, like the data side and the enablement. And now that we have an enablement lead, we actually have her go and do a pulse check called pulse checks, like check in with them. What, what areas do they not feel confident in? Now we know what yeah. our main is. And so yeah. we do that on a weekly basis as well as one thing I love about Spec it that really made me go from all the other tools to team <laughs> spec it was the um, knowledge checks. Because mm. you can also, when you release, let's say five new spec it's, right? And mm. some might have be a quick two minute read, some might be a 10 minute. We can do a knowledge check, which is in my way of saying a confidence check mm. of how people feel like they can do this new rollout. And that is also how we test how well we rolled it out. And then by also having those weekly syncs, because it is like enablement yeah. isn't like one stop, we're done with this, moving on to the next thing. It's enforcing it, enforcing it. And there's the 2.0 version and then building the 3.0 version. And so we're always going back to the drawing board of making sure that confidence score of reps is high and the knowledge. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, I, I do believe that's why we did not call them quizzes because there's a connotation with quizzes that you either pass or fail. And so the knowledge check is just there, honestly, for our side to understand, like you said, if it was received and then they can recall and just to understand like current state, the lay of the land, do you understand what's happening? Three or four quick questions, then we can go back to the drawing table or pat ourselves on the back. (laughs) The way I would tie this too, right, is I love that we're also like this content uh, content is queen. Content yeah. is, content yeah. is get that down. Um, but what I love is that, you know, there we're talking about how it can be used on the behemoth tool, for example, like Salesforce in this example. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ways that if you're going to take anything from this, that I would say to raw a fast ROI enablement content strategy on Salesforce is you always kind of have to do kind of like what they, what they do in the movies or like a book, do the spark notes or do the trailer. So your first layer of enablement on a beast like Salesforce, which is awesome, is to do the overview of if you're X, Y, Z, if you are an AE, here's how you're going to use it nine times out of 10. And you just do a general overview. And that overview then is linked. That content is linked to other content pieces, like other spec kits that says, if you want to know how to, you know, move forward with your op creation, or if you want to just specifically know how to create an op. Here's a more in-depth video with all the fields in the step-by-step in five minutes rather than a 10-minute you know, overview. And then you have sub pieces that add to that overview that go more in-depth. That is how I've seen outrageous adoption with a big yeah. uh, wow. CRMs. And well, I, I do want to say no enablement person wants to train on tools. Like, let's just put that out there in the ether. That's not what we want to do. And so I think that that's really brilliant of how we get around that in elevating it into like workflow enablement. We, there are things that people need to know about tools, about workflow. Um, but I think it's uh, creating that curiosity within sales reps that actually really goes a long way that helps make them more curious to go search for their own learning, because we know that learning today is really self-paced. I want to learn, you know, at my own pace in my own modality, I'm going to go search it in a specific way. And so catering to all of those needs. So I think that that's brilliant. You don't have to be a huge company to make this huge enablement turnaround. We're less than a hundred person company. We brought on, (laughs) we brought on, 25 people at once yeah, with only two managers to go through. And we brought our enablement person on with that cohort. And so we didn't have the human support 
that had all that knowledge. We hired people, part of that group to add to that human support, the people managers and the enablement leaders. However, they were still part of that cohort. So they didn't have yeah. the internal knowledge that we all did when we were bringing them on. What helped was building out that enablement infrastructure and building out these best practices that we're talking about, the overviews, and then every mm -hmm. section goes going more in depth because the feedback we got, we had one rep that came from a 400 person company and they literally said in the feedback, this is the best onboarding and enablement I've seen. And I've come from bigger companies. Yeah. So for all the growing and emerging companies out there, you can build this outstanding enablement function if you break it down to these core uh, practices, best practices or, or ideas. That's awesome. Yes. And I think that that's what people are searching for too. I know that we've talked a lot about um, the the value that it has brought, spec it and or this learning culture has brought your reps and your managers. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it has done for you internally? Um, maybe a promotion. I don't know if yeah. we can directly correlate that, but you know, what has it allowed you to be able to do, and or bring to the organization that, um, yeah, what's in it for you? Well, I go back to this. If the org wins, we all win, right? So if the org <laughs> yeah. you grow. And I say that to my reps all the time. If you want a promotion? Let's all win as a team. People will get promoted, right? Yeah. So I came in there as a senior manager of nothing. Like I was the senior manager of a team to go build out, right? So we built out one function of this team, um, the SDR program, BDR program, however you want to call it. And right away, 2.5 million, six months, we grew it to six, seven people. Then you go into the, and that, that was literally not even a full six months. That was like middle of Q2. Then you go from Q2 to Q3, scaling it to about 13 sellers. Now we're at 3.5 million with people still ramping. And you're seeing that we are crushing our ICP. We're bolstering on the top. Well, what's also happening? AEs are starting to get to the adoption. So then you see, mm. oh, wow. We do need this. Um, my company did not really have a RevOps function. We did not have an enablement function. Well, when you execute one thing, you, you can see that sometimes there might be a now that we've seen success and growth, other departments start to be born. So this <laughs> enablement and operations. So we started to have the need for that. And maybe that was my evil plan all along. No, uh, <laughs> we, had the, we had the need for that, right? We needed also cross-functional um, you know, communication and buy-in from all the different department leaders in alignment. Yeah. So it went from senior manager to then director of, or it went to, sorry, senior manager of sales development, senior manager to sales development and revenue operations. That's when literally RevOps was created because I started helping marketing, started helping CS, started really streamlining the processes of sales and, and actually building handoffs between marketing and sales. Then we realized, holy smokes, like we need to scale further. We need more people for that department too. So we went from like zero <laughs> to three wow. in RevOps within six, seven months. And that's what helps if you look at the trajectory of my career. If you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see again, manager, first thing, build out a sales team, top performing sales team. Cool. Part two, build out operations to help the infrastructure and continue to be that scalable piece to all the other department leaders and teams wow. or three, build out that team so it could stay strong. <laughs> and, everything. and that's where we're at. I built out the, I co-built out the uh, sales org. We took it from two to 40 people. We were crushing quarter after quarter, even in this down economy, we are still moving at a very fast pace. Why? It's not only do we have a great product and great people, but it's the process behind that that is enforcing the scalability and making the machine just continue to be a well select V8, uh, V8 engine. And then wow. that led to, okay, pass the torch on to now we have great leadership in there. They're crushing it. Let's move on to now scaling revenue operations and the strategy behind that further. And that's where I'm at today. Wow. I love that. I was just going to ask what's next. And yeah. I think that that's, you know, what, what a great business case that you just, you know, laid out as to how to actually justify the, um, the valid 
nature of what we do within an organization. And I think, you know, a lot of us search for how can we actually measure our own success? How can we be advocates for our RevOps teams and, or what we do to the impact to the business. And I think that that is such a beautiful way to put it all together. And not only is it going to help our stakeholders, obviously, if your company wins, if our companies are, are performing and bringing in revenue, like that is ultimate key, but think about like the impact that it's had on you. And I think that that's, that's a really great story. So I appreciate you sharing that. It was so impactful that our VC wanted me to go talk to other VPs in the portfolio because we were leading in terms of outbound sales. Wow. We were breaking, we were breaking away from the status quo of like bringing people in and then, you know, what's the retention versus the coaching out. We had high retention. We had high results and we had them fast. And that was because yeah. we had the content and the processes very strongly in place for that scalability. And literally when I would go talk to other, um, we're very, our VC is very close. And so when I would go talk to uh, other VPs, that was the first thing is they were like, so what are ways that you think we, we could make this quick shift? And I'm like, if you have the enablement and the process and the operations part down, you could have a, a C, B or A player and they will all perform at the capacity that you need for the business if you have strong mm-hmm. process and enforcement and enge- enge- engagement behind that. Wow. Yeah. What an opportunity. That's incredible. Um, I know that we have in and around about 15 minutes left. So as I ask this next question, um, go ahead and put in the chat. We'll, we'll open it up for some Q and a, um, but you know, thank you Keegan for sharing your story. I think it's really great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Sindling does? Yeah. <laughs> if, if the people on this call haven't been Googling, hopefully not, but like have been Googling, like what is Sindling? Can you tell us a little bit about what, you know, you all offer? Yeah. They're, they're like, who's, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Sendlane is a e-commerce SaaS platform. We are a combination of email, SMS. We're about to drop reviews and we're basically literally the all-in-one solution for e-commerce marketing teams. We're literally doing more with less. That's actually on our website. Do more with yeah. less stack because we are amazing. consolidating and really trying to bring a holistic marketing retention and automation machine together. And so awesome. we went from series A to series B. We went from 40 to uh, just shy of 100 and we're continuing to grow. That's amazing. Well, wonderful. Uh, we do have a question here. So, oh, the age old question, how do you break bad habits that reps either already have or have adopted? How do you do the unlearning? Um, any tips for, you know, anything in and around Salesforce or in general? Yeah, I actually, uh, I, I talk about this with leaders all the time. I'm like, when we look to hire, do you want to train someone that's never ridden a bike or do you want to retrain someone that's ridden a bike? Like that's how I always look at it. <laughs> enablement. And I don't hide that from reps. I'll, I'll pull together people that maybe have prior habits that are different than what we're doing here at the org that might not be best yeah. practices and say, hey, I get it. Y'all uh, learned how to ride a bike. I'm going to show you how we ride the bike here at Sunday. So let's take mm-hmm. a couple steps back. I really want you to follow the along some of these learning pieces and these beckets. And then here's an, a workflow assignment I want you to go through. And you tell me how you feel doing it now with these new best practices we just showed you. That's awesome. I'd have reps come to me being like, I mean, <laughs> just for example, like you could do Salesforce, right? That's one. But like, I think what's always a, on the sales side, a little bias, like outreach or sales off. A lot of people have used that in the sales career and mm-hmm. you're taught a thousand ways to use that. Um, we had, you know, 40% of our reps come in being like, yeah, I used outreach before they come in. And they're like, I've never been taught how to use it to this capacity. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I've used it for five years. And I'm like, yeah. well, that is why we do what we do at enablement. Is we only, we build out the 1.0, the 2.0, the 3.0 versions. So by the time we get more of those talented people that come in with these, you know, bad habits or prior habits, we can show them the new way. <laughs> yeah. Well, that actually reminds me of a story. So back in the day, I used to work at Dave and Buster's. Yeah, I did. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I was a server. So like, let's, you know, I did go into event planning, but um, I remember interviewing for that role and they actually, they're a huge corporation. They have 
Dave and Buster University. Um, but the, it was a pretty competitive, I mean, server, you know, it was pretty competitive and I just went in there and I was like, Hey, listen, I don't have a lot of server experience. And I know the hiring manager came to me and said, actually, that is why I would prefer to go with you than someone else, because you don't have any of the bad habits yet that, uh, that potentially other servers do. And I was like, wow, I had, I didn't even really think of that now, um, potential follow-up question, but as we think about, um, hiring diverse backgrounds too, what an opportunity to be able to get someone off the ground super quickly into an industry or into a company completely different than what they were doing, um, and have them ramp quickly because, um, now that door is open. And I think that that's actually a really beautiful story that, um, we could potentially tell. And I know you told a story about either hiring athletes or someone that was potentially in the military before coming into the tech sector and how quickly they ramped up. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Our team has such a, a mixed every background of like education levels, levels of like, you know, how they grew up, income and everything. It's, it's amazing to see that if you build out again, the process, the structure and the foundation, more people are going to succeed. So yeah. um, one of the things I think SAS is known for is over acquiring a lot of experience for entry-level jobs. Like, let's just call that out. That's a lot of oh, companies yeah. that do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's BS because if you that that just shows that they're lacking the infrastructure and the content and the enablement to be able to support more people. So mm. what we did is before we go and hire, we built out the infrastructure. And so we have, we have, we have people that have, um, you know, with college backgrounds, non-college backgrounds, people that have been in tech, people that have never been in tech. They were flipping burgers before. We have people that were in the military and then coming over. You're going from, I've used maybe one or two of these tools like a CRM before to, hey, I have to use 16 tools in my a daily function. <laughs> um, that's a lot. Yeah. Well, guess what? Yeah. They're performing. Why? Because they have high adoption in the process, the infrastructure around them that enables them to do their job. That's so awesome. You can build that through. I actually tell people in full confidence, I, I don't care if you have experience or not, because I truly believe in what we built out. Anyone can go through. We put that through the test. It worked. Amazing. Yeah. We even hired, uh, in someone that was a ballerina before, and she is absolutely crushing her role. So, um, it is just a true Testament. Awesome. Well, last question is a little bit around your thoughts on, uh, rebuilding processes while the plane is flying, you know, the old age old tale of yeah. so much going on. Um, tell me a little bit about like your thoughts on how to rework or rebuild those processes while things are still potentially in flight. Yeah. So actually it was the first thing I told the new enablement hire throughout onboarding. I say, I want you to take note of everything from the peers that you're going through on this onboarding mm -hmm. and the enablement. And I literally want you to break it, <laughs> build it new and better. I literally challenge people to break what we have so it can be better for the next group. So it can be better for the next, space, the, the next challenge we have. And so what you do is you kind of have that extreme ownership culture of if there's something broken, let's talk about it and yeah. to continue to move forward and continue to build while we're moving forward. So it's, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that I do have now someone on that team that can specialize and, and really help run that. But it can't just be one person. We got managers to buy in. We've got team leads, yeah. we've got veterans, uh, you know, sales reps to buy in. I'm saying, hey, <clears throat> if this is broken, we need to step up and maybe we come up with a, 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 a loom or a video on how to do this new process. So that way we don't have to wait two more days to get it out and spec it. So for example, we are switching um, our email domains and that's a lot. Like every rep had to go in and connect it. Yeah. And instead of having you know, 25 different meetings <laughs> or 35. <laughs> it was, Hey, we're going to build out a spec. Like, we don't have one, but we need to make the shift. Um, I'm going to find time to make one with uh, enablement with Ronnie. Well, rep just goes, Hey, why don't we just meet for five minutes after this? And I can record you showing me it and I'll give it to Ronnie. So then we can give it to the whole team. Like, again, you get buy in, you there have you go. buy in at the beginning and then people will step up. You made it a habit. That's amazing. Definitely. Um, last question is, uh, in current economic environment, you know, a lot of our enablement folks have potentially been let go. You know, we're doing, we're having like more lean teams on the rev side. So 
Um, you know, I, I certainly feel for the community there. A lot of my peers have been impacted. So any tips or advice for RevOps professionals that now, now are inheriting this enablement effort and what kind of tips and tricks do you have for them? Um, my tips is let enablement be one of your like strongest pieces in your arsenal of value. Mm. You are in charge of basically the whole org knowing how to do their job and do it well. So the more you put into it and the more you surround those best practices, the better ROI the company's going to see, which then if everyone starts to go into that momentum of winning again, I mean, trust me, there's been quarters where we didn't, we weren't like pacing to win and then we turned it around because we made those shifts but I know what it's like to also try to make this change in a losing or a down environment. And we went back to going back to the basics of enforcement and yeah. confidence and knowledge. And that's what got us through these slow times to where we had like last quarter, last week, we were down by 22,000 and everyone can we came together with this new plan, new best practice, rolled it out, had the knowledge checks in there, had everyone buy in. And we finished on the last day at 5 PM. 4k above goal. Ooh. So Ooh. I'm not saying that's for everyone, but what happened is we came up with leadership, came up with a plan, and then we enforced that plan having content behind it. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think that's very applicable. You know, we're all, we're all looking for, how can we help? How can we still do more with less? And I think, um, back to that question is, also lean on your communities. You know, there's a ton, the enablement community is hugely supportive. And so there are a ton of, you know, free assets, um, people out there that can help, especially if you have a question, a lot of us have done this before. Um, and so, you know, let the community help in this time as well to help either get you on your feet, um, to pressure test, you know, an idea or help solve a problem with saying that Keegan, where can people find you? How you can, can you, uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm, all, I'm active on LinkedIn. I post once in a while. I got to do better at that, but, uh, <laughs> find me on LinkedIn, just Keegan Otter, like the animal. Um, not too many other Keegan Otters out there on LinkedIn or, or anywhere really. Um, but yeah, always, always open to have a discussion about, um, enablement. And that is something I hold dear and near to my heart because I always tell people from when I was an ath uh, youth, ath uh, athletics coach, Hey, I got to teach you how to throw the ball catch the ball and hit the ball the best way and the correct way before I say, let's go play a championship game. That's awesome. Amazing. Well, I know that we will provide LinkedIn profiles so that you can connect with Keegan. You can also connect with me. Um, I just want to say thank you, Keegan, for being here. Your energy, your Celsius is working. Um, <laughs> your, yes, your energy and your insights and just um, helping to explain and break down the process of how you've used either tools and processes to really drive that productivity internally is just very inspiring. And um, we absolutely wish you and Sinlane the, the best uh, moving forward. I know that you guys are going to continue to crush it. Well, thank you. And we wouldn't be able to crush it. I got to give a big <laughs> shout out. Uh, you know, I will say y'all helped me get promoted because your tool's awesome. So <laughs> thank you to you and Beckett for making my job easier. Oh, I love that. Well, with that, I also want to say thank you to those who joined. Um, you can read further the case study that we have with Speckett and Send Lane in detail. Obviously, connect with us and our speakers. Um, if you're looking to actually build the ROI of what we just spoke about, we have a calculator on our website that you can help then build that. It's now in the chat. And then we do have a content is queen webinar um, coming up. It's a content strategy webinar. So within this follow up, we will have resources for you. But for all that joined, thank you so much. Thank you, Keegan. And with that, have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye, everyone.